connections. You focus on one dot. And if you focus on a dot without peripheral vision, then you don't see how the dots connect. So you, you're in completely in the dark of the bigger picture. You only see one dot within it. The idea is to get people to focus on something so that the peripheral vision um, is not there. And as we as humans are passing through this maze we call life, trying to understand it, trying to survive another day or another week, another year, we have endless diversions. That's his keep right, even though he's going left. Um, and, and you see these uh, you know, signs that says good luck. <laughs> Um, and it's all over society are these diversions to keep us in a bewildered state. What's going on? What's life about? Why are they doing that? What that what, uh, uh, uh. And when, when you connect the dots, because individually, what is it? But when you connect the dots, um, it starts to take on a clear, clear picture of what's happening in the world and why the world is as it is. And you realize there's an elephant in the living room, an elephant in the room that is just there being ignored.
of scientists presented the most recent and spectacular use of peanut butter ever. They have proven it's possible to turn the common peanut butter into the most expensive gems in the world. Diamonds The formation of a natural diamond requires very specific conditions, like exposure of carbon-bearing materials to high pressure, ranging approximately between 45 and 60 kilobars, but a comparatively low temperature range between approximately 1600 to 2370 Fahrenheit. Мы находимся в Башкирии, в Нитогорском районе, близ деревни Ишмурзина. В данный момент я нахожусь на вершине холма, который на местном наречии звучит как Байкара, как Большая гора. И называется Сиим. Вот, пожалуйста, здесь вот просто нагромождение валунов, причем громадных валунов. Вот, может, вот, все больше на природное похоже. Вот, пожалуйста. То есть никаких ячеек, никаких гладких форм. Если только вот такие большие, но это уже больше реально похоже на природное образование. Как после взрыва. Большого просто громадного взрыва какого-то вот изнутри что-то все просто взяло и сдохнулось. Вот видно. Взрыв. Такое ощущение, что здесь когда-то был какой-то подземный ход или лаз какой-то который вот завалил в процессе. Если вот туда вот присмотреться, то там ясно прослеживаются пустоты. Там. Вот. Оттуда, во-первых, несет очень сильно тленом. То есть там что-то гниет, что-то разлагается. Оттуда дует ну, то есть мы туда не полезем ни в коем случае. Да, конечно же, мы туда не полезем. Оттуда дует ветер. Вот если вот так вот просто руку приложить, то потоки воздуха очень как бы сильно чувствуются, что они идут оттуда. Угу. То есть местные жители говорили, что здесь был золотой прииск. Да, местные жители. Может быть, говорили, это вход в него, да? Прииск, но вот как бы не факт, конечно, что это он, но. А, возможно, вот я, наз... я называю это мегалитической башней, которая да, рухнула. Все, да. Камней странной формы. Очень интересно. Основно преобладает шестиугольная форма. Сейчас, Гриш, я поближе. Вот, вот. Ага. Шестиугольная да, вот. форма. Причем обратите внимание, что очень, очень ровный срез. Подозрительно ровный срез. Вот такое ощущение, что это камни искусственно, то есть как-то их обрабатывали. Также здесь присутствуют камни с э, таким вот закруглением, да, то есть скругленные камни тоже. Ты знаешь, плавно, медленно э, верти камень в разных плоскостях и не торопясь, чтобы это было видно. Ага, вот, вот да. Вот опять же, то есть с ровным срезом. Очень интересно сочетание этих камней то есть такое ощущение что эти камни э... огромные даже камни обратите внимание очень хорошо видно как это все дело скрепляется
сейчас еще чуть дальше, еще лучше будет видно. Очень хорошо прослеживается. наглядный образец структуры материала очень хорошо видно из чего он состоит то есть можно даже вот некоторые вещи пытаться вытащить Those floodwaters had all of the mud rolling around in it. The mud was covering everything, keeping things from oxidizing or having oxygen in it or whatnot, and petrifying it, turning it into stone. Don't let mainstream science fool you. They, they want you to think that, you know, um, it takes millions of years to turn something into stone or, you know, only certain things can be turned into stone. Petrification is a very easy process if you know, if you understand how it works and it can be applied to anything. So, the ancient world turned into stone. It was covered in mud, it solidified, it densified, and all of those minerals that are mixed up in that mixture of the ocean water and the debris from the terraformed world, those minerals made their ways into the pores of the bodies and into the plants and into the technology and everything. And um, when the flood... They call it junk DNA, 
But it's also contained even more importantly within our spirit memory. For those of us who reincarnate and we continuously come back here, right? We've, we've, we've been there. We've been in, in those places. We've been in that fantastic world. We were involved in those wars and those fights. And we knew how to, how to use magic. And it was a normal thing in our world. You know, most people, when they talk about reincarnation, they talk about like, I was a cowboy in my past life, or I was a medieval princess, or whatnot, okay? Personally, I don't have those soul memories. I remember something that's altogether fantastic compared to the world after the cataclysm, okay? Um, not to say that I don't have sporadic memories or whatnot, um, but let me wrap everything up here. Let's wrap some things up. The world was a garden paradise, okay? Let's try not to make the mistake of applying something we have learned so far to everything, right? So, for example, if I say the Titans turned into stone, I can't just go and say every everything I see that's stone is a Titan. Pardon me. Um, the whole world was turned into stone. The whole world was fossilized and petrified. That Man. mainstream science can't explain it. This mud fossil theory explains it perfectly. This is how you make charcoal. You start with two barrels. First barrel gets holes punched in it down there. And gets the top cut out. The second barrel turns into a cylinder. Pack it as full of wood as you can vertically, as densely as you can. Then you're gonna start a fire on top. All right, after your fire gets started, the cylinder or the afterburner gets set on top. And the top closed, just let it sit. All right, after it cools down, this is what you're left with. Let it cool all night. We'll separate out what didn't charcoal. Put in the barrel with the next batch. All right. One of the most astounding artifacts in the history of archaeology has been discovered in the city of London in Texas. United States, not England, guys. In 1934, the hammer appeared embedded inside a rock, and since this discovery, there has been many theories about its origin, and most importantly, its incredible age. But how did this hammer end up embedded inside the rock? Well, wait until you hear this. For the hammer to finish inside the rock, it had to have been built before the rock was formed and that would be hundreds of millions of years ago. According to the studies from the Institute of Columbia, the inside handle underwent the process of carbonization, and the head of the hammer was built with an iron purity only achievable with modern day technology. But the idea of millions of years of uninterrupted gradual change is now being challenged by many scientists. Astrogeologist Dr. Eugene Shoemaker at the Lowell Observatory was one of the team that discovered the Shoemaker-Levy comet. He disagrees with the creationist time scale, but his research on impact theories shows that dramatic catastrophic events have shaped the face of the Earth. The view that we have of the role of large impacts today actually challenges the old paradigm of uniformitarianism right to its roots. Indeed, the notion that comets might hit the Earth and produce catastrophic changes is an old one. It goes all the way back to Edmund Halley in the 17th century. And it was part of the background of the debate that occurred in the 19th century between the advocates of catastrophism on one hand and uniformitarianism on the other. It turns out in the 19th century, the uniformitarians won the debate at that time. But in fact, they were wrong, or at least partly wrong. And the catastrophists were partly right. So we really have to reassess this 
whole idea of uniformitarianism, which has been taken now for several generations to be an underlying principle of geology. It just simply isn't right. Gradualism is still the foundation of modern geology. But mounting evidence of catastrophism is causing geologists to revise the conventional theories. Creation scientists believe that the greatest catastrophic event in Earth history was a recent global flood that destroyed almost all life and shattered the continents. Their claims are supported by studies of local catastrophic events that can be observed today. We do know of catastrophes that occur today, uh, volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, tsunamis, uh, hurricanes, those sorts of things. And uh, we can certainly, in a sense, apply the same principle, the present is the key to the past, and we can actually look at uh, rock units and pro geological processes that are catastrophic in the present, and we actually see those features in the rock record. And that gives us a clue that maybe the, the past wasn't all that quiet, and when you've got fossil upon fossil upon fossil that show evidence of catastrophism, it begins to give you a different picture of the total geological record as somehow not being a slow and gradual thing, it points to a catastrophic past in the Earth's history. Thousands of trees were swept from the hillsides and deposited in Spirit Lake. One of the things that, that, that most puzzles me about the conventional way of thinking about the Earth is fossil deposits. Uh, the fossil forests here at Yellowstone are, uh, are, are distinct layers. We find petrified wood. Do those represent 27 distinct fossil flourished, which flourished millions of years ago. The signs at Yellowstone here used to say that. They used to say that there, there were countless tens of thousands of years involved with each of the forest layers and that, that uh, the whole rock strata sequence took 40 million years to form. But as we look at those fossil deposits, we see that they're similar to some of the things that, that happened at Mount St. Helens volcano. A whole series of upright uh, logs were deposited at Mount St. Helens in the bottom of a lake. And the mud flows at Mount St. Helens made uh, stratified deposits with upright logs embedded in the deposits. And each of these may look like it was a separate forest over many, many thousands of years, but this uh, process of redepositing logs creates what in our ordinary experience looks like would require millions of years. The modern thinking about this may indicate that catastrophic processes are better at making fossil wood deposits and, and even upright logs embedded in the rock strata than the slow and gradual processes are.